Well, hello and welcome to Thank God It's Friday, Bloomberg Quinn's weekly edition where we bring to you market experts views and uh, who better to bring than market veteran Nilesh Shah, the MD at uh, Kotak Mutual Fund. Uh, Nilesh, uh, you don't really need an introduction and uh, thank you for joining us at Bloomberg Quinn. Uh, let me start by asking you about yesterday's mayhem. Was it just a case of uh, investors uh, taking it as an opportunity to book some profits, just a routine correction is how we would term it? I think market is a little bit ahead of its fundamentals. The valuations are a little bit on the higher side, just you know, a few percentage is not significant. And uh, obviously investors are looking for some reasons to book profit. Um, yesterday, strikes provided an opportunity. It could have been very well some other reason. So I do call yesterday's correction as a mayhem. And when you are up 20% and you come down 2%, that's correction. That's not mayhem. Okay. Did you use an opportunity to buy uh, yesterday to uh, increase their allocation? Certainly would have uh, bought. I was in Kanpur and Lucknow and I tried my best selling to investors that this is the time to invest into mutual funds or equity market if you are expert. But invest on a longer term basis. Don't right. expect miracle in the totally. short term. You know, yesterday's correction was a pointer that markets are markets. You can try to predict as much as possible, right. but there is certainly one event which will get you by surprise. So, uh, I, I'll just come, uh, I have just something to ask you. Uh, Nilesh, I just wanted to try to understand what are some of your um, uh, foreign investors really telling you? How are they perceiving India given the current valuations? So very recently we met a group of family office investors who visited India for the first time. and. Uh, they didn't tell in as many words, but I could interpret their body language as saying that, look, we should have visited India earlier. Right. I think, by and large, in our interaction with foreign institutional investors, and we do service most of them across Japan, across Europe, across US, across Middle East, I think the guys who have not yet got India experience, then they are regretting that decision. Right. The guys who have India experience and who have invested into India, they are looking to increase allocation. Some guys looking at lower level, some guys looking at current level, but by and large everyone is looking to increase India allocation. So overall, I find foreigners more bullish on India than probably some of the local players. Right. So in the past, you have spoken about, in the, in the very recent past, you have spoken about a few risks that India faces. Uh, one of them is interest rates and the other one is the upcoming elections that we'll have in a few very key states in India. So I'd like you to elaborate a little more on these risks and if there are any other risks that you also see which could come into play. So some of the risks which we can foresee today is related to Fed rate hike. Right. Uh, you know, as a kid, we all grew up on a story of tiger coming, tiger coming. Yeah. So the Fed is like the tiger coming. Like the villagers, we now believe that while Fed chairwoman is saying rate is going to go up, right. we believe that it's not going to go up. Right. Till now, we are proven right, and that's why markets are here where they are. But indeed, if one day tiger comes, and the villagers are believing the tiger is not going to come, that day is going to create a mayhem. Now I doubt whether the Fed will like to, you know, not warn enough and strike. But they have been warning all this time in the past and not striking and which is yeah. why there could be some amount of, you know, miscommunication between the Fed and the market. In that scenario, our markets could have some correction. If we are at 30,000 sensex and Fed rate hike happens and we give an impression that we are going to go for another four hikes, certainly yeah. market corrections will be bigger. If you are at 27,000 and Fed says that look I have done one hike and I am done with it, then probably there will be no correction. Right. So you have to view Fed in that context. The second thing is obviously the elections. Uh, we have seen markets correcting, uh, you know, post Bihar election results. We see markets moving up post Assam results. So clearly today at this level of valuation market is rising in that there will be continuity of economic policies. Right. Now, these policies are associated with the current government. Absolutely, yeah. And there is hope and belief in the market that same policies will continue. Now, if the state results give an indication that these policies will change, 
either because there could be change in the government or because there could be change in the policies, then certainly there could be some correction in the market. Okay, um, I just wanted to understand, Nilesh, will 25 basis point hike by the Fed, even if it does come in December, does it really make too much of a difference for India? It is not 25 basis point hike which will make or mark, but it is the post 25 basis point hike, the course which will be given. So in December 15, after a gap of a 10 year, <coughs> Fed increase rates and give an indication that I will raise rates four times in next year. Right. Now that was too much for market because they were not expecting Fed to raise rates that okay. rapidly. Right. Finally, market was proven right, but in the intervening period of Jan and Feb, markets corrected. So it's not 25 basis point, it's how much more thereafter which will drive what will happen to the prices. And again, coming to the second point that you're making on the politics, uh, you think that uh, the current regime is, uh, well, what, what kind of probabilities at the back of your mind would you assign for the BJP to continue in, uh, to be in power? Uh, I have no idea. Uh, voters are too diverse. 2019 is far off. Yeah. Even April 2017, when the first state elections will be held, I mean, that's too far off. In six months, right. anything can happen. So all I'm saying is that today market is priced in pro-reform government policies right. that has helped improve India's current macroeconomic situation that has given confidence to investors. For example, on 29th of Feb 2016, the finance minister honored his commitment on path of fiscal prudence. The world was telling him that forget fiscal prudence, go and spend money, create growth, create jobs. And the finance minister said that, no, I want to honor fiscal commitment. The promise which I made to the market, I will honor it. Right. That one act of honor created bottom of stock market for some time to come. From that day's level, not even once we have fallen below that level. Right, right. And if you see on 29 February 2016, so many people on television, they were saying, what's there in the budget? Right. It's such a bad budget. But markets ignored all those pundits and consistently moved up thereafter. So this is the impact of government policy. This is what market wants to believe will continue. Now, if because of state elections there is any reason in change in this policies, then markets have to give some reaction to it. Right. Let's talk about the mutual fund industry uh, uh, fund flows trends. Uh, Nilesh, um, do you really think that the retail participation has picked up as per your expectation? So if I look at the past, I feel extremely satisfied and proud of what we have done as an industry. I have 1.1 crore SIPs that bring 3,500 crore a month. I have 5 crore folios. I have delivered return which is fantastic. I go today to a mall, people come and shake hands. I. I mean, there are elderly people who have come and, you know, blessed me saying that Beta Tera Fund is good. And I'm sure this is happening to many other people in yeah. the industry. I'm not the only guy who is getting blessed. There are many people who are getting blessed. So when I look at the past, I feel very happy. Okay, for 20 years what you worked, there's something visible today. But when I look at the potential, when I look at the possibility, I feel terribly disappointed. I have 5 crore folios. If I assume average investor is 5 for years, that's 1 crore unique investors. My potential is 25 crore. How will I reach 24 crore? When will I reach those 24 crore? When I look at uh, my equity AUM, it's roughly about 5.5 crore across the industry. Now, in 1990, Unit Trust of India had raised 8,000 crore in master share. Right. When did we raise 8,000 crore in one fund, even in 2015 or 2016? So, compared to our own glorious past, the potential of future is probably 25 times more, and we still need to work hard. We haven't even covered. We haven't even begun looking at the potential. Right. Right. Okay. So, uh, where are the retail inflows actually directed? Uh, of course, uh, more uh, probably into equity funds and some into income funds. But has there been any shift or uh, change in the mix as far as uh, the equity versus income funds are concerned? And again, does that really, uh, in any which ways, mean that uh, debt markets are more favorably placed than equity markets right now? Do you think so? So. 
we are not a homogeneous country, we are a heterogeneous country. We have all kinds of diversity possible in our country. So the first time investors are probably more coming towards fixed income fund. Okay. But there are experienced guys who are happy to come on to the equity side. Yesterday we ended up collecting two and a half times more than what was our normal day collection. So corrections in equity market instead of deterring people like in the past are actually bringing more flows into the market. There was a time when, when there was a correction, we will go on a call to the distributor and we will tell them, don't worry, things will get sorted out, long term everything is good. Nowadays, our distributors call up and say that, Nilesh bhai, don't worry, everything yeah. will you know, happen well. So there is a tremendous amount of maturity in retail investors, especially the guys who have experienced equity mutual funds. They have seen the benefits of SIP, they have seen the benefits of long term investment, they have seen the stupidity of trading, they have seen the stupidity of going and doing direct investment and losing their pants and shirts and hands and mouth. Yeah. So there is one class of investors which is behaving tremendously with maturity. They are able to take volatility on their stride. But as I mentioned, this is probably 4 or 5 percent of my universe. Right. I still have to teach 95 percent how to make that equity investment. What is SIP? How is volatility their friend and not an enemy? why we tell people to be a long term investors and so on and so forth. So there is, you know, depending upon how you feel, either glasses half full or right. glasses half empty. Right. Totally. But uh, again, uh, coming back, uh, repeating the question, are debt markets currently more favorably placed than equity markets? Uh, honestly, if you have three to five year horizon, my guess is that equity markets are far more preferably placed than debt market. You look at debt market, when I started my career, the bank fixed deposits used to give 16, 17, 18 percent. Sometime after that it became 13, 14, 15, then it became 11, 12, 13, then it became 9, 10, 11. Right. Today they are available at 7 and 8 percent. I have no doubt in my mind that 3 years, 5 years down the line, bank empty rates will be probably 4 and 5 percent. Now. That's going to be far, far superior to 0% in negative interest rates in some market. But will you be happy with 4-5% return? Today, people presume that bank fixed deposits are safest instruments. They don't realize that they carry tremendous amount of reinvestment risk. You don't go and put into 18% FD for 20 years. You put it for one year, two years. Right. After that, it has become 16, then 15, then 14, then 7, and it will become 4 or 5. So you are taking tremendous amount of reinvestment risk. Your only solace is in taking risk because that's going to give you return. There's no free lunch. You don't take risk, you don't get return. Right. Equities, real estate, commodities, these are all the areas where you're probably going to get better return than fixed income. And week after week, we have touched upon the, uh, the importance of investing in equities as compared to a lot of the other asset classes. And Nilesh Bhai, actually that also brings me to my next question. And this is actually a user question. This is from Avinash Reddy. And he asks, uh, what is your outlook on gold and how do you pitch it against other asset classes? So Avinash, gold, we are the largest owner of gold in the world. You tell me when will Indians start selling gold and who will buy from us? Uh, long back, you know, when I was starting my career, I had gone to one elderly gentleman saying that, Uncle, if you can teach me something, it will be good for me. And that uncle said that, you know, you are a young man, you are never going to remember what I tell. But just hear this story, it will guide you. So there was this particular broker who received a call from his client saying that, what's the price of stock X? He said, 10 rupee. That guy said, why don't you buy 1,000 shares? Next day he calls up saying, what's your price? He says, 50 rupees. He said, oh, very good. Buy 5,000 shares. Third day he calls up, what's your price? He said, 100 rupees. He said, yeah. oh, great. Buy 10,000 shares. Fourth day he calls up saying, what's your price? And he says, 150. So he said, why don't you sell all my shares? And the broker says, whom will I sell to? We were the only buyers. Right. In gold, I force a similar problem. Everyone is feeling happy that, oh, gold prices are here. Oh, great. But who's buying that gold? Indians are buying that gold. Right. If we will come to sell, who will buy from us? My feeling is that gold does not create value. It does not give dividend. It does not give bonus. Of course, it outperforms inflation. It matches inflation. We already have more than sufficient gold. Uh, from an investment point of view, probably every Indian who can 
require gold in his portfolio is more than sufficient. Right. And hence, let's avoid investing in gold. Instead of gold, Avinash, let's go and invest into gold and entrepreneurs. They are going to create far more opportunity right. for you than buying gold. And incidentally, in today's world where every Indian is saying that I'm very proud of my military, I'm very proud of my country, let's remember that by buying gold, we are exporting money overseas. India doesn't make any gold. India doesn't mine any gold. In last 10 years, we have exported $220 billion overseas for import of gold, silver and diamond on a net basis. We are a poor country. We need those monies to be invested into hospitals, schools, colleges. So if we love our country, I think we should avoid gold. Right. Okay, so I'm going to shift focus to some of the sectors and uh, I want to talk about a very beaten down sector, which is, which, uh, this is the information technology sector. But uh, this is, of course, owing to uh, uh, client spends, which have come off a little, at least according to managements. Uh, their projects have become uh, shorter in span and the, the, the earnings are a little lumpy. What do IT companies need to do right now for, for the sentiment towards these companies to improve going forward? Oh, very simple. They just have to introduce Pokemon Go kind of game. <laughs> okay. <You> so <saw laughs> when Pokemon Go came, what happened to the company? The right. market kept bent up by a few billions of dollars. Yeah. And I don't think so Indian investors are looking for a few billion dollars of return from Indian IT companies. <laughs> right, right. They'll be happy with a couple of hundreds of millions of dollars. So on a serious note, Indian IT will have to move from infrastructure management, application maintenance, simple programs and simple products to complex things. Right. We'll have to move into digital space, we'll have to move into product space, we'll have to move into consulting space, we'll have to provide solutions, we'll have to provide gaming, we'll have to provide one day a product like Facebook or WhatsApp or uh, Twitter or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to go into data analytics. Now, it's not that Indian companies are not are venturing not, there. Not venturing they are already right. moving there. Right. But the contribution of all these exciting activities is probably far lower than the contribution coming from the other parts of the business. So we are in the Samudra Manthan kind of scenario yeah. where there is a churn happening. Now, for few companies, there will be poison and few companies, there will be amrut. Any Indian IT company which can move into digital space, which can move into product space, which can move into consulting space, which can move into gaming space, which can move into data analytics, which can move into artificial intelligence, I think will create value for their shareholders. Right, right. Indian IT companies which will just continue to remain on infrastructure management, application maintenance and stuff like that, probably they will find it difficult to create value for their shareholders. Right. Okay. Uh, Nilesh, if I talk about some of the consumers or industrial um, uh, sector companies, uh, they relative on a relative basis, they uh, seem a little bit uh, cheaper right now. Uh, and on the other hand, you have your consumer link sectors which have run up uh, quite a bit, uh, but are seeming expensive right now. And of course, for a reason, because growth does not really come cheap. Uh, but how would you allocate your portfolio between these two? So life will always give you this uh, problem that what I like is not cheap and what I don't like is very, very cheap. Uh, stock market is also going to be similar to that. And today we are seeing that in consumer related sector, the valuations are a little bit on the higher side. But this is the sector where you have seen earnings growth, 15, 20, 25 percent over the last two, three years. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, industrials, the valuations there are cheap for extremely leveraged companies and valuations are still reasonable for many other companies. Mm. But then this is the sector which is not showing any earnings growth. Mm. They are not increasing their order book, mm. they are not able to convert ex existing order book into mm. sales, they are not able to recover their sundry debtors. Net-net industrial companies today is on the back foot. Uh, consumption related companies are on the front foot because people are expecting good monsoon to revive rural demand, 7th pay commission to increase government employees consumption expenditure and they are lot, they are more than 1 crore. So between employees and pensioners, more than 1 crore people will go and spend 75, 80,000 rupees per family. That's going to boost consumption. There is also some amount of confidence now in urban uh, consumption, uh, courtesy, you know, many other things which is kind of improving their sentiments. So consumption is today expensive but there is earnings growth, industrial is cheap, but then there are concerns. In our opinion, probably for the foreseeable future, it's worth 
being overweight consumption sector rather than industrials. Industrials time will come, but probably that's 18 to 24 months away. Right now, let's focus on consumption sector, which is witnessing a bumper festival season. In Onam, Kerala automobiles witnessed uh, good growth. In uh, Nuwaka, in Orissa, people witnessed good consumption growth. In Mumbai, you know, courtesy probably because of Bombay municipal election and partly also because of overall growth, we saw number of pandas becoming double. Right. So my guess is that the festival season beginning from Dasera, Diwali, Christmas and Holi should boost consumption and that should support current valuation. Okay, fine. Then let's talk of, about one of the consumption linked sectors and I'm talking about auto. Now, I came across some interesting statistics recently. The penetration of four-wheelers in India is said to be close to 9% and the penetration of two-wheelers is said to be somewhere around 3%. I'm not sure how correct this data is but this is what I've come across and that did take me by surprise if these numbers are correct. Now, within the gamut of auto stocks, which do you prefer amongst four-wheelers, two-wheelers? One auto components. You know, this calculation does not look appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, we have about 25 crore total automobiles, of which four wheelers, my guess is, will not be more than two, three crore. Mm -hmm. And this includes motor cars, commercial vehicles, agriculture, tractors, and so on and so forth. And rest are all your motorbikes. Mm -hmm. The amount of motorbikes which uh, Hero and Bajaj uh, yeah. sell in a month. I mean, that's what the car manufacturers sell in a year. So this 9 in 3 does not look appropriate. Mm -hmm. There's some serious error over there. Mm -hmm. Today, in automobile, the longer term call is clearly fossil fuel automobiles getting replaced by electrical vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, global warming is going to put that pressure. Today, it's been put into developed world. Tomorrow, it will come into developing world. So on a longer term basis, I want to invest in companies which will be able to capitalize upon electrical vehicles. And it's not a far off day. I was in Kan Kanpur yesterday. I saw it in Jaipur. Uh, there are already electric rickshaws which are moving quite seamlessly in those cities. Right. So electric vehicles are not something which is there in US only. It's already there in India. So we have to take this longer term call within automobile sectors, be it two wheelers, four wheelers, commercial vehicles, whosoever it might be. Are they geared for electrical vehicles or not? Other than that, we believe right now, because of the EC availability of finance, as well as seventh pay commission, there will be spurt in demand for automobiles. The last sixth pay commission came in 2010. It's quite likely that in six years time frame, people would like to replace their car. If they bought Maruti 800 in 2010, it's quite likely that they will now go into Zen rather than Maruti 800. Right. So you will see some upgradation uh, from entry level bike to higher level premium sport bike from entry level car to mid-size sedan and so on and so forth but within that uh, segment i think automobiles will do well both commercial vehicles uh, four wheelers two wheelers everyone will do well right and on top of it the auto components also will do well there's already increase in the base of uh, automobile uh, units and that's how automobile component guys will also make money because they now have to provide replacement parts to those uh, Right, right. Okay. Avinash Reddy is asking if you think cement uh, stocks are overpriced right now. Uh, if you are looking at short term, yes it might be. But if you are taking a longer term cycle, then I don't think so. One, you can't import cement. It's too bulky. We don't have that kind of cargo or port facility to import. So it's a pure domestic story. Second, the demand for cement is going to go up because now there is availability of water. Where in southern India, most parts of India has sufficient water to mm -hmm. carry out construction activity. So for two years, we had depressed cement demand because of lack of water. Now we will see that suppressed demand getting spurted up. Third thing, the newer capacity addition for cement manufacturers is coming under pressure. If you were able to set up a cement plant in about two and a half to three years in the past, it is extended to probably four and a half to five years because of you know, land acquisition norms in mining and so on and so forth. Uh, if I remember correctly, we are now adding over next four years capacities in cement, which we had added almost in just one year in 2003 or 2004. So your newer capacity additions are getting diluted or limited. The demand is expected to grow up. You can't have import. Now you know what's going to happen to cement prices and what's going to happen to the profit of the cement manufacturers. 
So my guess is that while in the short term it's difficult to say whether cement companies are overvalued or not, but over a longer term you will still end up making money in cement sector. Okay, so uh, my next question is more to do with uh, choosing a stock, but in this case specifically to do with the management. And we actually have another user question whose name is Anu Gupta. He also has a question on choosing the management. Now, generally speaking, you know, we have the return ratios, the debt, the equity, the, the growth rates, everything at our disposal right now. The only thing that is hard to gauge is whether our management is reliable or suspect. How do you decide that? So... Anubhai, my recommendation is that when you have to choose, you know, Jamai for your daughter, how are you going to choose it? Uh, it's not that you are going to get too much of data. Yeah. At least for some of the promoters, you have past track record available, you have their historical performance available. But for Jamai, such things will not be available. You will be taking a calculated guess. You will probably visit him, you will talk to him. You will check with uh, neighbors or some relatives right. and you will arrive at a conclusion. Now, by and large in India, most people, whether they are literate, illiterate, educated, uneducated, have been able to find a good Jamai for their daughter. Our divorce rates are not comparable to some of the developed nations. Right. If an illiterate person knows how to pick up a Jamai for his daughter, I think Anupai, you are too smart enough not to pick up a good promoter. Yeah, yeah. How do you pick up good promoter? It's all about the past performance, the past track record. Why is the brand Tata, you know, in gold? Because when Tata still came under trouble, Dorab Tata and Ratan Tata pledged their wife's jewelry to take loan for the disco and they survived that company. That's how Tata brand is built. There are so many such examples where we have seen promoters going out of their way to protect their companies, to protect minority shareholders. They have worked hard to create value for shareholders. Don't ignore past performance. While there is always a caveat which says that past performance is not necessarily indicator of future performance. In terms of governance, I think past performance is indicator of future performance. Obviously, some Balia can go and become Balmiki. But right. it doesn't mean that every Valya is going to become Valmiki. That's exception to the rule. The rule remains that if the promoter is saint in the past, he'll remain saint in the future. Right. If he was crook in the past, he is unlikely to become saint in the future. Right. So a related question to that, you know, there are tight-fisted promoters who do not want to give the power to their management and then the, on the other side you have other promoters who will give all the power to the management and the management is running the show. In fact, very recently we had Mariko, where Mariwala, Harsh Mariwala gave all his power to uh, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Gupta. So my question is, what role should a promoter play and what, how does that differentiate from a management in the company? So, purely from an investor point of view, could I care less if promoter is making money for me or a manager is making money for me? Let me ask a hypothetical question. If you had a promoter who returned from Harvard yeah. and if you had a manager who was just SSE fail, uh, does it make sense for promoter to give up all the powers to that manager? Who knows? Yeah. There's yeah. no guarantee that Howard return person will be great and SSC return SSC failed person will be bad. Right. But you have to take a call based on the work they are doing. It's right. not the educational background, it's not the cultural background, it's not the social background, it is also not the status whether you're a promoter or a manager. All we want is capable person running companies, taking calls and protecting you know, shareholder interest. Right. Now, whether it's a promoter or a professional manager, I'm indifferent. Absolutely. Right. I'm going to come back to stocks. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Nidish, um, Ajanta Pharma and Aisha Motors, two of the um, biggest outperformers of the last uh, decade. I'm talking about mid cap. So, Ajanta Pharma has returned 200 times and um, Aisha Motor uh, uh, eight, uh, 85 times in the last decade. So I, don't know, I just want to know which could be the next Ajanta or Aisha or I mean if you can, cannot talk about stocks at least which sector are probably these next set of outperformers likely to come from say a decade from now. So my recommendation is that look, it's not that today sitting here I can predict future. If I had the ability I will do it for myself rather than giving it freely to other people. Now let's see what are the factors which achieve this. So obviously Ajanta and Aisha were small cap companies which have now grown to become large cap companies. That's where you will make maximum money. Now how do you pick up winners 
from small cap to large cap. It's a strategy of monkey to gorilla to King Kong. Right. In the hindsight, I can say that, look, I was so visionary and smart that I picked up this stock and it became a King Kong. Mm. But in reality, everyone has to nourish so many monkeys. Some of them will die, some of them will grow. They'll become gorillas. Now, I have to invest my more money with gorillas. And out of that gorillas, some will remain gorillas, some will again become monkeys, monkeys. and someone will become King, King Kong. Kong. Now, if I have done the strategy of monkeys to gorillas to King Kong, in hindsight, with the benefit of hindsight, I will be able to go and tell the world that, look, I was visionary enough to go and pick up the King Kong. Don't tell them that I had so many monkeys and of which one pick up King Kong. Right, right. But if you are going to target buying one monkey and hoping that it's going to pick up King, King Kong, Kong. I mean, please consult your astrologer or you should be tremendously lucky. Right. No, then then the prob you could probably tell us uh, which is the, um, you know, sector that you're the most bullish on or something that holds the maximum potential for, say, a double-digit sort of a earnings growth. I understand a lot of people are only talking about consumption, uh, which is going to be the next big theme. But within consumption, uh, within that no, space... No, so sir, everyone says we are on the cusp of a very, very big bull run. And all bull, bull runs will have a few sectors which will lead... So, so let's not focus too much on sector. Right. Uh, you know driving? Yeah, I do know driving. Okay. So if you were given, let's say, Fiat or Ambassador, and I was given BMW, yeah. and both of us were supposed to race, Right. what will you as an outsider bet upon? Who will win? Probably somebody who has a BMW. Of course. <laughs> well, anyone will say that this BMW driver is Absolutely, going to Absolutely, yes. Now, they must know that I don't know driving. Right. You will start your car and reach destination right. and I wouldn't even know how to start the car. Yeah. So it's not the car alone, it's also the driver which is important. In the sector, you could be sitting with a great driver right. or you could be sitting with a very bad driver. So essentially life is two by two combination. You have good businesses, good promoters, yeah. very good chances that you'll make a lot of money. You have bad promoters and bad sectors or bad companies. You, you really require tremendous luck to make money over there. Right. Then there is good promoters in bad company and bad promoters in good company. Sure. And again, it becomes too much of a luck to win. Right. So you focus, focus on good promoter as well as good business. Now, good promoters, you have to go back into the past to check what has he done. Does he work hard? Does he siphon off money from the company? Does he take minority shareholder for a ride? Does he have so much of interest or to be on page 3 that he doesn't have time to come to headquarter of the company and so on and so forth. On the other side, how do you arrive at good businesses? Any business which does not require dilution of capital and can generate free cash flow return for you. So in a very common man's language, if a company is able to pay you dividend and yet grow the business without taking any money from you, or without taking any debt from the market. I think that's a great business. Right. That business is going to compound your wealth. Right. Now, that kind of business could be there in consumption stock, it could be there in investment stock. Uh, I'll give you an example. Sri Cement is a commodity business. Cement was a commodity. The amount of money which they raised in IPO for a setting up a million ton cement capacity, from that they have created 25 million ton cement capacity. They haven't come to the market for taking money. So with the money which I gave to them to become <coughs> owner of a 1 million ton cement plant, they have already made it 25 million. Right. Without asking ever money from me. And in right. fact, they have kept on giving me dividend. Right. I mean, a commodity business, that's a great company to make money. And Sri Cement has delivered return in some of the bluest of blue chip names you can think of. So go for good driver, go for good industry or good company. That combination will always create money for you. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, what has been your best bet till date or any regrets where you really thought that you sold off a stock too early or you missed buying it? I mean, lots of regrets and lots of uh, moment of pride. I think I have reached that stage in life where I remember in 2008 uh, going to meet uh, in investors and they were obviously quite worried. And someone introduced us in that these are all the market gurus who have come to tell you what's happening in the market. And I just said that, look, this is wrong introduction. If I was market guru, I would not have lost so much money 
the market is down from 21,000 to 8,000 and you know there's so much of money which I've lost for investors and at that point of time in the middle of room someone stood up and said beta paisa to upar niche aata rahega jata rahega but at least this humility of accepting that I am a student of the market and not a market guru is something which will take you forward for a right. long period of time. Uh, I think that goodwill is my pride. That goodwill where my investors believe that yes, you have lost money for me, but I don't doubt your commitment, I don't doubt your integrity, I don't doubt your capability. I think what more one can ask for. Yeah. You can make as much money as you want to make by buying stocks, by trading in stocks, by shorting stocks. How will you build this credibility? How will you build this trust? I think today I can hand on heart say that not only me, but many of my peers in Indian mutual fund industry, most investors will say that this are really nice set of human beings who are committed, who are capable, who are talented, and who are really working to enrich society. Okay. Well, well I suppose my final question was particularly to do with that. Uh, you know, some inspirations or some books that have uh, led to your investment philosophy? So on the book side you become greedy. Uh, today you have a great <coughs> opportunity of you know just doing Google search and reading on any subjects you want to read. I'm not a technology freak but I still find tech talks very interesting. On right. any topic you go and listen you get virtually master at a free cost. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of books Obviously, with passage of time, my ability to read has come down dramatically, but I have compensated that by picking up, you know, online whatever I want to read, whatever topic I want to read. But my recommendation to people who have time and who have energy is to read at least one book a week and just pick up any book to read. Let it be fictional, let it be spiritual, let it be commercial, let it be economical, let it be completely else. Everything will enrich you, everything will leave you something. A fictional story can also help you pick up a good stock. A spiritual book can also help you cut your positions or maintain your greed and fear. Right. You never know whatever you have read, which is told in your mind, one day will come to help you. Right. Okay. I'm going to ask one mandatory market question. Uh, since we are uh, going to be going into the um, next week with the biggest event, of course, of the domestic market, which is going to be the RBA monetary policy. Are you expecting a rate cut on Tuesday? Uh, the whole entire market <laughs> is expecting rate cut and more. The yields have come down dramatically, clearly expecting RBA to cut rates. But more importantly, on a longer term basis, market will be looking forward to this governor to lay his agenda. Uh, so far, the governor has not laid out his vision for the future. So market will be more interested in finding out from him as to what are his priorities, how he is likely to conduct monetary policy, what are the factors he is envisaging and what kind of course you know, will be available for the financial market. So it's not just 25 basis point rate cut, it is also his agenda for the future. There's a lot of gyan for all uh, the viewers to take back and I hope you've got some good insights um, uh, by listening to what Nilesh had to say. But uh, Nilesh, bhai, it's a Friday today and uh, we want to know what your weekend plans are. Are you, are you uh, a fan of Garba or Navratri or are you looking forward to catching on to some good plays? Um, what, what, what do you do on the weekend? such question. <laughs> What can I say? I'm not a Gujarati in respect of Navratri. I don't know how to play Dandi. I don't know how to play Garba. My wife has been an excellent player of Garba and it's my regret that I've never been able to take her to Navratri. She doesn't festival. drag you along with her. <laughs> she gave up on me long okay. after watching her perform. Okay. So, no, I'm, I'm not a great uh, Navratri player. I, I think over weekends it's time to be with family, uh, read catch up on your readings, Reading. Uh, probably just spend time with family and unwind yourself. Yeah. Okay. And then Lishbhai, thank you so much for coming over. It was really a great uh, time uh, was, talking yeah. to you. And uh, for all you viewers, thank you so much for watching Bloomberg Quint. We will be back again with the next edition of Thank God It's Friday. Uh, but uh, see, you, uh, see you and uh, have a great weekend.